Good morning. Today is Friday, March 22nd, 2024. This week on Shabbos, tomorrow, in the synagogue, we begin to read Vayikra, the third book of the Torah. It is the book of the Torah that describes the karbanos, the sacrifices and the offerings that were offered first in the Mishkan, later in the first Beit HaMikdash, the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, then the second Beit HaMikdash. So the mode of serving God that is described in this week's Torah portion and the next of this book were in practice among the Jewish people for over 1,200 years. This form of serving God no longer is part of our practice and has been not part of our practice for over 2,000 years since the destruction of the Second Temple. But I want to share with you something very interesting from a scholar not so well known, but referred to as Talmud Harash. He lived in the 1300s in Spain. He was the student of Rabbeinu Asher. Not so much is known about his life, but we do have his insights into the Torah, and they're quite profound. He quotes from a number of prophets, later prophets, that God does not want our sacrifices. Yeshayahu Anavi, Isaiah the prophet, at the very beginning of his work, God says to the prophet to tell the Jewish people, Lamali rov zivrechem yamar Hashem. God says, why do I need all these sacrifices? Savati olos elim v'chele mariam. I have more than I need. I don't need your animal offerings, your sacrifices. V'dam parim v'kvasim I don't want it. I don't desire it. The prophet Yermio, Jeremiah, is even more uh, blunt. This is what God, Lord of hosts, God of Israel says. Olosechem safu al zivrechem Basar, you're continuing to offer sacrifices. Yermio lived near the end of the first Beit HaMikdash, the first temple in Jerusalem, when the sacrifices were still in order. You're offering me all of these sacrifices? Kilo dibarti esavosechem velotzivisim. I never commanded you to offer sacrifices. I never told you I wanted you to do this. Biom hotzi'io samiratz mitzrayim. When I took you out of Egypt, when I took you out of Egypt, I didn't ask for sacrifices. Why are you offering sacrifices? It's very, very strange because, I mean, the book of Ayikra, which we're reading in the Torah, God is commanding sacrifices. And then later, God says to the Navi, the prophet Yermio, Jeremiah, when you left Egypt, I didn't command you in, in sacrifices. I don't want your sacrifices. What in the world is going on? So I have shared with you an answer in the past, a very important answer. We'll leave that for another time. But this Talmud Harash says something that is fascinating. It's quite daring. He says that originally, God's original plan, plan A, when God took us out of Egypt, was not to have us serve God with sacrifices. God wanted our heart. God wanted our service through prayer. Prayer is the preferred mode. And the idea was that prayer would connect us to God, allow us to communicate with God, display our connection to God, develop a relationship of intimacy with God,
And then we made a mistake. Then we built the golden calf several months after leaving Egypt. And at that point, God recognized that he had to teach us the principle of curative repentance, of ways of doing actions to be able to seek atonement for the mistakes that we made. And that was facilitated largely through the sacrifices, through the karbonos. So that the Mishkan and the Beit HaMikdash and the karbonos, the sacrifices, and all those rituals, that was really the plan B. You remember we discussed this earlier. This was the opinion of Rashi that we talked about, not the opinion of the Ramban, but this is like Rashi. But this is the plan B. What the prophets are talking about was the original plan. The original plan where God did not originally ask for sacrifices. It was only because of the mistake that we need, because of the weakness that we uh, demonstrated, that God saw it necessary to have something that was more concrete, more visible, more um, uh, um, tangible as a way of serving God. Then came a time when we had the sacrifices no longer. When the second Beit HaMikdash was destroyed by the Romans, and now for over 2,000 years, we have not had a Beit HaMikdash. Which means that with the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash and the end of the approximately 1,200 years of serving God through sacrifices, we return to the plan A, to the original plan. And that's what the prophets are describing. The original plan where our main mode of serving God is through prayer, not sacrifices. God says, when you left Egypt, I didn't command sacrifices. That was only later after there was a weakness, after, after there was a mistake, a sin of the golden calf. But that wasn't the original plan. Now, this approach of the Talmud HaRush turns on its head our common understanding, and we've discussed this many times before, that prayer became the main mode of serving God when the sacrifices stopped as a substitute for the sacrifices. And we've discussed before, why should prayer be the appropriate substitute for the sacrifices when it was no longer in practice? But the Talmud HaRush says no. Prayer is not the substitute for the sacrifices. The sacrifices were a replacement for prayer. And when the sacrifices stopped, we returned to the original plan, God's first preference of how we are to serve God, which is through prayer. We don't normally think of Purim as a prayerful day. Yes, we pray three times, like every day. But certainly in the synagogue, there are too many allowed distractions. There's costumes, there's noise, there's silliness. It's quite hard to concentrate on prayer in the synagogue on Purim. But my colleague and teacher, Rabbi Mark Penner, shared a deep insight. And it goes like this. On Purim, there is a unique detail in the laws of tzedakah, of giving charity. All year long, according to Jewish law, before giving tzedakah, I have the right to investigate. Is this person truly needy? Will the funds be used properly? I have the right, I'm not required to, but I have the right to look into it to make sure the person or the cause is worthy before I give. On Purim, and on Purim Day only, 
There's a special rule called haposhet yo, called haposhet yado, nosed and low. Whoever stretches out their hand, give to them. On Purim, we don't scrutinize the worthiness of the pleader. Only on Purim are we magnanimous in our compassion. That's a law in the rules of tzedakah on Purim. Rabbi Penner said, the same applies to prayer, where we are pleading with God. All year long, God hears our prayer and then evaluates. Are we worthy? Are we deserving? Should the answer be yes? Or sadly, sometimes no. But on Purim, shouldn't God have the same standard that's commanded of us? Kol haposhe yado nosdin lo. Whoever reaches out their hand to God in prayer, God should grant it. Without evaluating, do we deserve it? Are we worthy? When we approach God sincerely, with a full heart in prayer on Purim, we should have an expectation, a higher expectation than during the year, that God will fulfill our prayers. And this is true for Purim every year, which means that prayer on Purim needs to return to its primary place on Purim, notwithstanding the normal distractions. This is true about prayer on Purim every year, but this year it takes on a heightened urgency. As we have discussed several times this week, Purim this year, during a war in Gaza, amidst a frightening surge in anti-Semitism here and around the world, this year Purim will be different. The usual silliness and raucous enjoyment is out of place this year. This year we focus on the essentials of Purim the spiritual joy for all the good God did and does for us, gratitude for the blessings we have, pride in our Jewish identity, confidence in our ability to overcome any foe, and the emotional joy that comes from helping others, sharing what we have, welcoming those who are burdened, sending messages of unity and support to our brothers and sisters in Israel, and reclaiming this year, especially Purim, as a day of prayer. The prayer of the Jewish people Instructed by Esther at the time of Purim, when Esther said, Lech kenosis kol hayudim, gather together all the Jewish people and pray to God to overturn the terrible decree of Haman. That worldwide Jewish prayer turned the tide from being in danger to triumph. The parallels to today are striking. And so may our prayers this Purim for the safe return of the hostages in Gaza, for the safety and success of the Israel Defense Force, for the healing, physical, emotional, and spiritual so many Jews need now, may our prayers this Purim have the same effect. In Megillah's Esther, the book of Esther, we read when the triumph occurs and the tables are turned, La Yehudim Haisa Ora the Simcha the Sasan Vikor. To the Jewish people, there was illumination and joy and gladness and honor. And every Saturday night, when we quote that line in Havdalah, 
At the end of Shabbat, we add the words, Kain tihiel lanu, and so may it be for us. And this year, pleading to God with whole hearts, we pray this prayer. This year, this day, la Yehudim haisa ora v'simcha v'sasam v'kar. May the Jewish people today be illuminated with God's light and joy and gladness and honor. And we add and plead, Cain Tia Lanu. So may it be for us. This Purim. My friends, I wish you a great day and a beautiful Shabbos. In a Purim where our prayers are at the center of our celebration, hopefully leading to turning the tide just as it did for Mordechai and Esther. Have a good Shabbos and happy Purim.